Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cropper here. Uh, imagine a time when everyone was familiar with stone, the types of stone there were, what good stone was like, good stone for this purpose or that, uh, where it was the primary commodity, the most important thing in the economy, stone. A uh, particular island off of Greece exported stone about 10,000 BC. It's commonly accepted, I believe, as from the sources I'm familiar with, that at about six or 8,000 BC metalworking started. We have a copper pendant from about 10,000 BC, I believe, uh, found in a cave in Iraq. But uh, I read in the National Geographic about a place in sub-Saharan Africa where they've found what is almost certainly a copper smelter uh, that dates to about 20,000 BC. However far back it goes, the Stone Age lasted from 750,000 BC up until about 6 or 8 or 10,000 BC. That's where the, the oldest uh, stone axes that look like a teardrop and then they, and then they got smaller and, and more skillfully shaped and then uh, they started making other objects and pretty soon there's a whole plethora of things made of bone and of wood. Then finally they found metal. Uh, metal was probably found in the Middle East. It might have been found in Africa, but then that passed away. But the finding of metal in the Middle East was sustainable for a particular reason. Copper is found, almost pure form, in uh, areas in the Middle East. Actual lumps of copper just sitting around uh, on the ground, you know, just like gold nuggets in some of the biggest gold uh, fiascos ever, like the thing in 48, California. It's just sift through the dirt in the stream bed and there's gold underneath. Well, that's how this is in some areas. Pure copper, like 90% um, or 95 or 99. Now, I get a lot of the information I'm talking about here from the Metal Smiths. Emergence of Man Time Life book series. This is a time when, when men will go a long ways to get the right type of stone for the right type of tool not clear back 750, 750,000 years BC, but at some point stone became a commodity that was traded uh, to a fair extent, you know, trade routes that you don't think of existing in the Stone Age, literally the Stone Age. Well, there were men who were very familiar with many different types of stone, and uh, if they're looking on a creek bed or something, or on an island, or in the mountains, watching different types of stone, uh, and, of course, I would hope some of them were foresighted enough to have experimented with different types of stone, obviously, or we wouldn't have everything we have today. They did have some tendency to progress, try other types of stone, other methods. However, the fact that those tear-shaped tear uh, axes, you know, were the staple technology for uh, 500,000 years or something, says something to the slowness of the men who invented stone technology. At some point, men who were very interested in stone technology found or saw or noticed lumps of native cop copper, most likely. Um, or perhaps they had a rock near the fire that acted different than most rocks. Metals. A bit bizarre. Gold and copper both, because gold can be found in native lumps also. And gold so easily worked, you can actually work it at room temperature with a hammer very, very easily. Um, and copper, not too hard a metal, a bit easy to work compared to other things. Um, and, and so that's how they first found copper, noticing a weird, me a weird uh, rock, a weird type of rock. In the area where copper is found in actual lumps of near, nearly pure native uh, copper. Now, this author, uh, Cyril or Cyril Stanley Smith, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, he says uh, on the introduction, just a one page introduction, we're down past the middle of it. He says, I myself learned the language as a metal or the language of metal as a metallurgist in, in industry when purely as a hobby I began to look into the history of my profession. You know, a profession ought to be taught by its history. But anyways, I soon found that though the history stretched back over many centuries, the earliest records could not be found in books, but only in museums in the form of art objects. Put that in your pocket. 
He continues, perhaps I should have anticipated this fact. A purposeful utilitarian mind is indispensable in developing an abstract idea to the point of social importance. But the discovery of something new requires the sensitivity and curiosity of the artist. An artistic mind would be the most likely to step outside of all the bounds of society, he's saying. An artistic mind. Shame that inventors can't have that same respect. I believe that they can. But it's no wonder that they use these things for art first before they use them for other utilitarian purposes because can you imagine if you've just learned to work gold or copper just just learned to work and you found a lump or you've got a few lumps and you're trying to figure out stuff to do with it you can make all kinds of stuff in the status of wearing something that you've made showing people this thing that you made is very different from saying well what kind of knife could we make with this copper blade you make a knife and it takes up enough, you can make 15 beads or all kinds of ornaments and decorations for it. So it's no, no wonder that extremely rare valuable material was used uh, for decoration rather than for utilitarian objects. You don't take titanium or beryllium and turn it into plowshares. You know, our plowshares are made of steel. Sure, titanium plowshares would be better. They'd never get dull, ever. You can have a razor sharp titanium plowshare doesn't even weigh very much. Tractor right now has to pull a three or four ton plow through the dirt. What if that plow only weighed a half of a ton and never got dull and never broke? That'd be great, but you don't use titanium for that. It's too expensive. Same thing in the Stone Age. You didn't use copper or gold for something which you could use stone for. And you can't do the things with stone. You can't shape it stone the way you can shape certain types of stone called metal. Right? It's a new type of stone as far as the Stone Age was concerned. He elaborates just a bit on what I've just said. So metals were not discovered because someone in the Stone Age wanted a better tool. This approach led only to better stones or to sticks that were shaped more ingeniously. No, metals appeared because millennia ago someone's artistic sensibilities were piqued by an interesting and pretty stone. And though a huge industry eventually developed from that first creative impulse, and though metals came to influence almost every phase of human activity, the successive new ways of working with metals almost always involved the decorative arts first. For reasons we've just seen, it's pretty reasonable. This book sheds light on that fascinating process. Uh, we'll just do just a bit here in, on page one. Now, for this case to hold true, that uh, the metal was first used in the decorative arts because it was a specialized skill. You don't use it utilitarianly at first. You use it uh, in a specific and beautiful way. So the first things uh, pique your aesthetic sense, right? They are pleasurable to you in an artistic way. And then those skills can be adapted to usefulness. Is this true with pottery? How did we develop pottery? Well, I read from page one, quoting... Professor, well, page 9, page 1 of chapter 1. Uh, uh, Professor Carol Stanley Smith says, uh, The makings of ornament from copper and iron certainly precedes their use in weaponry, just as baked clay figurines come before the useful pot. The first suggestion of anything new seems to be an aesthetic experience. So, there we have it. I put a little note out to the side. Productivity has its roots in creativity. The most creative person, an artist, would lead in the future to the things that are most productive. Look at the most creative men in the Renaissance and the productivity we glean from their methods, Bacon and Newton and Galileo. And look at the, pr the productivity uh, for making ornaments of gold and copper. Very pretty, shiny stuff. Shines. Now, copper gets a bit dull and green after a while. Gold never tarnishes. Seems magical if you're ignorant. That's why it has uh, acquired such heights of value in the modern world uh, and for all of history. Because it doesn't tarnish. It is absolutely inert. Anyways, that's where metal came from. Thought you might want an update on that.